All right, so in this last section of chapter 11, we're going to talk um, specifically about pain and pain systems. So the learning objectives for this section, um, I want you to be able to define um, referred pain and primary hyperalgesia. Um, list the factors which will improve the reliability of sensory testing. Even though that sh could probably have gone in a different PowerPoint, but that's okay. <laughs> it's all chapter 11. Um, I want you to know what the pain matrix is. Um, I want you to be able to describe the characteristics of acute pain versus chronic pain, and we've already talked about this in some previous classes. Um, I, mean, I want you to be able to compare nociceptive and neuropathic chronic pain. So we're going to talk about nociceptive chronic pain in this chapter, and then in chapter 12, we're going to talk about neuropathic chronic pain, and I just want you to know the difference, or be able to compare the two. And then I want you to be able to describe the five-level model of antinociception that we're going to talk about at the end of this chapter. So pain is frequently associated with tissue damage or potential tissue damage. That's an important distinction. Um, but pain can also be um, experienced independently of tissue damage. Have you ever watched um, somebody get a splinter in their finger and you actually feel it in yours? Um, you can experience pain without any tissue damage. Um, no susceptors signal injury, but they also can signal um, potential injury. So um, they, if the nerves are sensitized, um, they can send a signal saying there might be tissue damage. Um, persistent pain can affect emotional and autonomic function, and it can affect social life as well. So in um, 111 class last quarter, we talked about sort of the effects of chronic pain on society and on the individual. Um, chronic pain can be a huge thing, and that's a big issue in the clinic. So signals from musculoskeletal injuries can be interpreted as both fast and slow pain. Um, when the tissue injur is injured or ischemic, so deprived of blood, biochemicals that awaken the nociceptors are released. So some of those nociceptors are chemoreceptors that are sensitive to those chemicals released by cells. So nociceptors that are sensitized are excessively reactive to stimuli. And that's called um, peripheral sensitization. So I'll give you a recent example from, from my own nociceptors. Um, I was trying to clip my big cat Shadow's claws, and he's big and strong and doesn't like his claws clipped. And he has long, sharp claws, which is why I was trying to clip them. And um, he was having none of it, and he scratched the side of my hand <laughs> mercilessly, you know. So I said, okay, forget it. I'm not clipping your claws. So I had these two scratches on the side of my hand, and the nociceptors on that side were sensitized. So I had peripheral sensitization going on. So sensitized neurons can fire in response to normally innocuous stimuli um, with slight movements, and they can also fire spontaneously. So I have um, gloves that I wear when I'm walking to work and I'm walking outside, and one, the uh, left glove, which is the side I got clawed on, um, has a little tag on the inside. And normally, that tag is innocuous. It doesn't bother the side of my hand. In fact, I usually don't even notice it. But because my nociceptors were peripherally sensitized, um, that normally innocuous stimulus of the tag was really bugging me. It was really irritating the side of that hand. So those awakened nociceptors can cause pain where there's a little bit of tissue damage, you know, cat claw damage. It's, it's healing now. But the nociceptors are still sensitized. So that tag is still bugging me. So it can be something small like that. It can also be a big um, reaction. So unlike superficial pain, deep pain usually occurs after tissue damage. So superficial pain can occur from other things, but tissue damage is what usually causes deep pain. Um, the function, the biological function of deep pain may be to encourage you to rest the damaged tissue, which totally makes sense, right? If you have that like, oh, don't move that, it hurts. 
So um, the example from the book is after a low extremity injury, so say you twist your ankle, um, pain with weight bearing produces a modified gait. Um, the modified gait that you get is characterized by shortened stance phase on the affected side, and we call that an antalgic gait. So ant against algia is pain, so it's a pain relieving gait or a pain avoiding gait, basically. So that antalgic gait is caused by pain with weight bearing, and it's to cause us to um, rest the affected damaged tissues. Referred pain is pain that is perceived as coming from a site distinct from the actual site of origin. So referred pain is usually referred from visceral tissues to the skin. Um, there's a proposed explanation of this um, that's described in the book, and it comes from the convergence and facilitation of nociceptive information from different sources. So on page 211, there's a little um, diagram showing pain from the heart going down into the left arm via those um, convergence of um, sensory afferents, basically. And so really the, the idea of referred pain is that you feel pain in a certain area. It's coming from an area where we don't normally have that sensory information um, being given to us. A lot of our organ um, sense goes through the autonomic nervous system. It's non-conscious. We're not aware of it. So this is a way of making us aware that there's something going on in the organs. And again, you can think of it as a survival, um, a coping mechanism. The pain matrix, it's a, a sort of a way of describing um, the systems in the body that control pain. It consists of brain structures that process and regulate pain information. Um, the pain matrix, um, the brain structures that make up the pain matrix are capable of creating pain perception in the absence of nociceptive input. Um, the pain matrix includes parts of the brainstem, the amygdala, which is part of the emotional system, um, the hypothalamus, the thalamus, and areas of the cerebral cortex. So when I said before that um, the, the brain gets to decide if it's going to produce pain in response to that sensory stimulus, the pain matrix, these systems in the brain, are the part that processes that pain information and decides whether you're going to experience pain. So if you have pain matrix dysfunction, that can be one of the causes of chronic pain. The experience of pain is strongly linked to emotional, behavioral, and cognitive phenomena. So um, you need to, in order to understand pain, you have to consider um, discriminative, discriminative motivational and affective and cognitive evaluative components of pain. The discriminative aspect refers to the ability to localize the site, timing, and intensity of tissue damage or potential tissue damage. And you will see people in the clinic, they're very, um, for some reason, I think it's just how we are as human beings, they're very motivated to attach their pain to an incident the site, timing, and intensity of tissue damage. When did this happen? A lot of people will say, I fell down the stairs in 1972 and I've had pain ever since then. Well, clearly the tissues have healed since then, right? It's been a long time. But they're still experiencing pain. And, they, and their discriminative aspect is really trying to localize when did the tissue damage or potential tissue damage occur. So really kind of an interesting aspect of it all. The motivational and affective aspect refers to the effects of the pain experience on emotions and behavior, including increased arousal and avoidance behavior. So um, just recently I was working with a young woman in her 20s who has had previous disc issues and back injuries and that sort of thing. She um, she has been a, a regular exerciser in the past, but since her injuries, she is afraid to exercise because she's afraid to evoke that pain. 
So we're working on trying to get her going on a low-level exercise program that she can then increase um, to the point where she's back to normal. But she has a lot of avoidance behavior. Um, so we were doing bridging, just basic old bridging, and she said, well, I don't like to do bridging because one time when I did it, it hurt. So I said, okay, don't go, you know, modify. I helped her modify the exercise to a point where it wasn't painful. And I said, okay, do it at that level um, as much, you know, when you can tolerate it. And really we're trying to retrain her that exercise does not equal pain. The cognitive evaluative aspect refers to the meaning that the person ascribes to pain. So a lot of times we ascribe pain to injury. So people say, I'm having pain, there must be tissue damage. We know that's not the case always. There could be tissue damage, but there might not be. But um, people really want to ascribe their pain to tissue damage. Uh, people say that there's got to be something wrong. I know nothing showed up on the MRI, but I'm feeling pain, so there has to be something wrong. That's that cognitive evaluative aspect.